Next up in some harmonic motion, we are going to talk about damping and resonance, which are almost two entirely opposite ideas, but uh, both of which are related to some harmonic motion. So we're going to start with damping. Damping is basically um, when frictional force forces cause the amplitude of the oscillation to decrease. Basically, it's the reason why when you start this um, spring bouncing, it doesn't just bounce forever. Um, it's you know the idea that there is a oppositional frictional force to the motion, so the simple harmonic motion doesn't just go on indefinitely. <coughs> so basically, uh, eventually the amplitude is going to fall to zero, and the object will just return back to its equilibrium position. And um, the fact that there are damping also causes the fact um, that the total potential and kinetic energy will also decrease. So the fact that there's damping means that some of the energy will leave the system because um, basically there are frictional forces involved, so we will be generating heat as well. Um, so basically the energy is dissipated, so that thermal energy could either go into the objects or into the surroundings. So we classify the damping based on how big of an effect it has, and there are three types of damping that we need to know. So there is light damping, um, in which case the amplitude gradually decreases with time. And in this particular type of damping, the period of each oscillation will remain the same. And we just find that <coughs> the magnitude of the displacement just decreases each time, but it's still happening over the same time period. Um, so this is kind of what you get with the spring, you'd see it with when you push them on a swing, they'll slowly swing to a stop. Um, it's probably the one that you'll observe the most. Same with pendulum would have light damping as well. Um, so that graph there shows um, just another example of light damping. So um, amplitude gradually decreasing, happening over the same time period. Our next one is uh, called critical damping, which is um, basically as extreme as you get. So um, in this case, we go straight back to the um, equilibrium position. Now, sometimes you might see um, with critical damping that it might go past the equilibrium position and then come straight back, but either would be critical damping, but really it's when it just returns back to the equilibrium position as fast as possible. Uh, the main example for this that I can think of is, um, you know, you've got those doors that can swing both ways. Um, and sometimes you swing through one and then it very slowly just returns back to equilibrium. That would be critical damping because they've just made the system so the door doesn't bounce backwards and forwards for ages, but it just goes straight back to shut. So that would be an example of using critical damping. Heavy damping is um, basically that it, it's, it's similar to critical damping, but it goes, it goes a lot, it doesn't get there as fast. So critical damping, we're going to get back to the equilibrium position and stay there. Heavy damping, it'll take quite a while to get there. It will happen over time. Um, heavy damping, you're more likely to see it go past the equilibrium position and come back. Okay. Right, so we've just had the things that stop oscillations. Now we're going to talk about the things that cause oscillations, so forced oscillations. Um, basically, this is just the thing that makes the oscillation happen. So if we think about um, someone on a swing, they are being forced to oscillate by the person who is pushing the swing. Now if I just displaced the swing from its equilibrium position, it would choose to swing at its own preferred natural frequency. If, however, I keep pushing the person every time they come back to me, then I am forcing it to oscillate at a frequency that I choose. Um, so that's basically what the idea is here. So all dance systems have a frequency at which they oscillate. If they're displaced, <coughs> that would be their natural frequency. Forced oscillation is when I make it oscillate by periodically applying a force, so basically pushing it after the same amount of time over and over again. Um, and we'd call that the applied frequency or the driving frequency. Now. The amplitude of that system, so I've got something that wants to oscillate and something that's driving it to oscillate at a specific, specific frequency. Now, how big the oscillations are are going to depend on a couple of things. First one is how heavily the system is damped. And the second thing is how big the difference between the applied frequency and the natural frequency. If the applied and the natural frequency are very, very close, 
then we can get something that's called resonance. If they're very, very far away, then we get very, very small amplitudes because we're trying to force it to oscillate at a frequency it doesn't want to, so we don't see much amplitude. If, however, I get my applied and my natural frequency very, very close, I'm forcing it to oscillate at the frequency it wants to oscillate, that it's naturally designed to go at. And that means that we get a really big amplitude out. And this is called uh, resonance. So basically, we get our maximum amplitude when the applied frequency is equal to the natural frequency of the system. And that's what we call resonance. Or we might call it the resonant frequency of the system. Okay, so let's just have a look at some example of resonance curves. So this is a graph where I've got uh, the amplitude of the system and the applied frequency. So the frequency of the applied force. It's not how big the force is, it's how often I'm applying it. So how many times per second we push the person on the swing. And <clears throat> that's, this dotted line here is showing you the amplitude of the driving force. So that's how big the driving force is. And this second dotted line is showing you the natural frequency. So basically, if I push uh, from here, um, then I'm saying that I'm going with a much lower frequency than the applied frequency, and um, the driving force has this much amplitude. So we might expect we can see what the frequency or what the amplitude of the driven system would be. So we have a look. It's going to look a bit like this. So if I have a system with very, very light damping, what I can see is that if I apply a driving force um, at a frequency much below the natural frequency, I get fairly small amplitudes. And to start with, I basically just get the amplitude that I put in. As I get closer to the natural frequency, the amplitude of the oscillations get much, much higher. They come to a sharp peak and come back down again. If I go too fast, what I actually find is that the oscillations, the am so the amplitudes of the oscillations almost disappear because you're pushing it so fast that it hasn't got time to go anywhere and it just kind of sort of vibrates on the spot rather than having a significant amplitude. Uh, so this is very light damping. Uh, once we get to just, you know, slightly lighter damping, same shape, much lower peak and a little bit flatter. More damping, not surprising, I'm going to end up, same thing, slightly lower peak. But in all of them, um, the peak comes where I have the natural frequency. So if you were to ask to draw a graph, sketch a graph of this, um, I'd expect to see, you probably wouldn't need to label the driving force amplitude, but you would definitely need, need to label the natural frequency of the system. And we would expect this um, drop in amplitude on the higher frequency side. So just some notes to take from that. So uh, if the damping is increased, the amplitude of the driven system is decreased at all driving frequencies. If the damping is decreased, we get a sharper peak uh, in the uh, peak amplitude. Uh, the amplitude of the driven system tends to be equal to that of the driving system at very low frequencies, zero at very high frequencies, and at a maximum when the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency. So basically just what I've said, just in some nice neat notes for you. Okay, resonance. It happens a lot. So my example I've given you is pushing on a swing. The reason you manage to go high is because you get pushed at the uh, natural frequency. Musical, musical instruments. So stationary waves are a lovely example of resonance. So when I get it vibrating at a frequency that means that I can fit a full number of half wave vents on there, then I get a standing wave. So that's resonance. I can get the much bigger amplitude out. Um, tuning circuits in radios and TVs. Um, so orbital resonances of moons. So basically the way that moons go around uh, planets. And this is the interesting one. Um, resonance isn't always a good thing. So most of these things would say are good things. So um, being able to make music, being able to listen to the radio. But we could have resonance that's a bad thing. <clears throat> and the best example of this one is um, bridges. Bridges have a tendency to collapse if you vibrate them in the wrong way. And there are two ways of doing this. One of them is the wind. So you have to think about what the wind is going to be like in the places where you build your bridge and make sure that it will not cause a resonance effect because that can cause it to collapse. 
Um, so this is an example of the Tacoma, <coughs> Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, basically, the wind caused a resonance system, which then caused the bridge to collapse. Uh, this was from 1940, and there's a nice video of it. Um, so there's a link to it here. I will put it in the notes as well, so you can have a look and can watch it actually happening. There is a commentary that goes along with it as well. Um, another example of bridges being made to collapse is when soldiers walk across them. So normally, you know, soldiers, when they're marching as a platoon, they march together and in time. When they go over bridges, they will be explicitly told not to march in time, because if they do, it can cause a resonance effect. So the driving force of their uh, steps all in time can force the bridge to resonate, and if it happens to hit the natural frequency, then it can cause the bridge to start tearing itself apart. So, there you go. Hopefully you didn't know that already. Try and put fun fact in somewhere. Um, okay, so that is it for resonance and damping. Um, as I said, you can see they are two sides of a similar coin. Uh, it's all thinking about what happens to the amplitude as a result of them. Okay, so I will see you in class, and remember, ask me if you have any questions.